Well, let me say good morning to you as well on this Easter Sunday, and a special welcome to the family of Fiona and Annalise for coming to the baptism. We are very glad that you are here, as I'm sure you are glad too. You know, it's one thing to hear about a baptism. It stirs certain emotions in all of us. It does at least in me. But it is another thing to actually be present for that baptism and to see these young ladies commit their lives to Christ. It is a real privilege. It makes me wonder sometimes if we think the same way about that resurrection morning, wishing we could have been there, wishing we could have seen Jesus with our own eyes, wondering if life would be better for us or different for us. Well, actually, I'm here today to tell you that the real privilege is living after the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ because now we see clearly in His Word and through the Spirit clearly what He achieved. He took our sins on the cross. He gives us new life by His resurrection. His, his sent Spirit is now for our benefit. We get to enjoy peace and hope through faith in Him now. He replaces despair with joy. He replaces despair with joy. Did you catch that point made by one of the young ladies who was just baptized? I know we just heard it a minute ago, but let me reiterate something that she said. Quote, The knowledge of my sin weighed heavily on my soul, especially as I grew older. A false sense of pride fed the perfectionism that discouraged my soul. Every mistake was another spot on my already filthy record. Somehow, despite learning and growing up in the truth, I struggled with lies. I flickered like a candle. I was consumed with myself. The idea that I could somehow be safe in myself seems silly now, but the ease with which it pulled me away from God is anything but silly. God showed me just how weak and helpless I really was. I can't do anything to rid myself of sin. God did everything. Those are words of hope. That's real hope. And all of that because of the risen Christ. Today's scripture reading makes the same point. The risen Jesus gives real hope. And as you listen to it read, I wonder if you will hear the same thing that I heard. Mary's mood changes from this shocked despair to joyful confidence. And that is the same thing God wishes for His people today. To go from despair to joy. So listen as I read John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1-18. through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. 
and that he had said these things to her. This is God's word. (laughs) What a dismal beginning for Mary that resurrection morning. She comes to the tomb to tend the body of Jesus with spices, and the body is missing. Imagine something similar happening to you. You go to tend the grave of your father or your grandmother, and the grave is dug up, the casket is open and empty, the body is missing. Your head would be just swimming with thoughts. No idea how this is going to end. That's how Mary felt. And what's even more striking is Mary doesn't recognize Jesus at first. She saw him but didn't realize it's him. That's verse 11. When he approached her, she did not know that it was Jesus. One very simple explanation of Mary's confusion is her tears. She is weeping. John makes that point very clear. Over and over again in this story, John says that she is weeping. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Verse 13, the angels ask her, woman, why are you weeping? Verse 15, Jesus asks the same question, woman, why are you weeping? So why doesn't Mary at first recognize Jesus? The very simple explanation is that Mary is looking through tears which make Jesus blurry and unrecognizable. But frankly, that's too simple of an explanation based on what John writes. Because John, with his writing, pushes us to ask a deeper question. Why is Mary crying? The short answer is Mary believes a lie. And that is distorting everything that she sees. Mary has assumed that Jesus is still dead. And so that alongside this terrible, unjust death, Now Mary has to deal with the idea that someone who is just being downright cruel has taken his body to dishonor his memory even more. Mary thought Jesus was dead. And again, John makes that very clear. Look again at verse 2. Mary ran to Simon Peter and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. She says to the angels in verse 13, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And in verse 15, supposing Jesus to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Everything is being distorted by this lie that Mary believes. Look, I'm not even sure she recognizes the two angels as heavenly beings since she doesn't seem to have the reaction that most people have in Scripture. It's one of fright when they see angels, not Mary here. She mistakes Jesus for the gardener since it makes more sense in her thinking that the gardener would be talking to her and alive instead of Jesus. Mary does not believe the truth. Mary is confused. She is not seeing clearly. And until Jesus reveals himself to her, she can have no real hope. Mary's tears and confusion represent all of us, really, to some degree. It represented one of the young ladies who was baptized. Again, I will remind you of what she said. Despite learning and growing up in the truth, We struggle, she struggled with lies. Mary grew up with with truth. Mary lived with the truth, the way, the life, Jesus. And she still is confused. Though Jesus has risen, we don't always see him clearly. And when you don't see Jesus clearly, then you are susceptible to lies certainly to confusion, and maybe even some tears. I've been a pastor now for over 30 years, and I have seen lies come into the church and out, in and out, back and forth. And one of the present lies that I see in the church is the lie of despair. So many of God's people seem in despair, and it sounds something like this, no one could look at my sin and love me. No one could look at my sin and love me. And so we hide thinking, I am alone in this life. 
There is no peace or joy there. I'm not sure whether you believe in Christ today or not. If you don't, there is joy and peace in Him. You can turn to Him. He will not disappoint you. He will not turn you away. But for those of us who claim to be in Christ, why are you believing a lie? Why are you despairing? Reminds me of a story that I came across this past week where a mother is writing about an incident she had with her little girl. Listen. She starts by saying, Where are you hiding? I call out my daughter's name while peeking under the table and in the pantry. My voice rises in frustration as the search continues. Please come out when mommy calls for you. At last, I find her in the corner of her bedroom, curled under her white sleeping mat decorated with tiny pink castles. Her legs are pulled close to her chest, and her messy blonde head is buried in her folded arms. Pieces of broken pottery lie on the floor beside her. My anger has reached boiling point, and harsh words are ready on my lips. She raises her head, and I stop as I see something I've never seen before reflected in her three-year-old eyes. Shame. My heart softens. I know that look. I've had that look myself. When I've done something wrong and wanted to hide it from others, when I felt burdened by my inability to defeat sin, when I believed I've messed up too much this time, the angry speech I was ready to give her melts away and I drop to the ground next to her. I pull her close and she cries against me. She is broken over her sin. She doesn't know what to do other than to try to hide. I know that feeling. It's a lie. It's a lie of despair. There is a risen Christ who, will, who willingly forgives and gives us joy. That's what He does with Mary despite her lie. He does not walk away from her. He comes close to her. He wants to reveal His mercy to her. These lies stand no chance in the, pre in the presence of the risen Christ. This is something that Paul said, not in story form, but in letter form, when he wrote to us in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation, that coming together, and as Jesus comes close to Mary, she rejoices. The question is, do we rejoice? Or do we still believe a lie? As the song goes, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Satan actively drawing old sins to our mind, convincing us that we still somehow bear the guilt and shame of each one of them. Not for those who are in Christ Jesus, because Jesus died for our sins. And that sin is what caused our guilt. And that objective guilt has now been set aside at the cross. And any internal shame we now feel is a lie. When we do have to revisit those sins that we continue to commit, we are not told, go hide from mom. Go hide from dad under your pink blanket. We're not told that. Instead, we're told if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. As Jesus moved toward Mary on that first resurrection morning, He moved, moves toward us today as the truth to clear up our confusion, 
to dry our tears, to lift our despair. He is alive. And on that first resurrection morning, he said, Mary. And her spirits were lifted. And today he says, Bethesda, Christian. And it lifts our spirits. And so the very next thing that happens makes total sense, doesn't it? Mary embraces Jesus. I mean, think about it for a moment. The events of the past week have been horrific for her. On Friday, she saw Jesus die. On Saturday, she had all day to think about it. On Sunday morning, she comes early to the tomb for what is a funeral, really, because she was not able to be at the tomb because of Sabbath starting on Friday evening. Now she gets to the tomb, the stone is rolled away, the body is missing. What is she thinking? What is going through her mind? Surely she thought she had lost him forever, once in life and now in death. This is the one who had freed her of her demons, Luke's gospel tells us. Jesus is the one who instructed her in this new way of living and thinking, and now he's gone. But suddenly, he shows himself to her. He's alive. Of course she's going to reach out with both arms and embrace him. That makes perfect sense. What doesn't make sense in the story is the reaction that Jesus has. That reaction of, Mary, don't cling to me. Let's look at it one more time in the text. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. If there are any curious statements that Jesus uttered while he was on earth, this has to be one of them. Not just a curious statement, but particularly at the time he utters it. Mary has just spent all of her emotional and physical strength to reach out and embrace Jesus, and he backs off. It seems like he is rejecting her affection and her love. But actually, something better is happening. Something more wonderful, something more amazing is happening. The Son of God had to take on a body in order to be the sacrifice for sinners. And He retains that body now in heaven for always, for all time. When we see Him face to face, we will see Jesus in His body. Though it's resurrected, it will still be a body. That limits Jesus, if you will, in his person. In his person, he cannot be in every place at all times. He has limited himself. And as mysterious as it sounds that we say God has limited himself, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive certainly, but it's part of his perfections. The fact that God can't do certain things is good. The fact that Jesus can't be everywhere in his incarnated state, though resurrected, is a good thing. Think of it this way. Eventually, word's going to leak out that Jesus is in the garden and Mary is with him. And so the disciples are going to start coming and flooding, if you will. Well, eventually, Mary's going to be crowded out of being able to embrace Jesus and not only give him affection, but receive affection from him. As Peter crowds her out and John crowds him out and disciple after disciple just starts to go down that conveyor belt of hugging Jesus, he can only spend so much of his energy, so much of his time. And so Jesus says, don't cling to me now because I have something better in mind. In 40 days, I will send my spirit. And when I send my spirit, that will be the opportunity for you to receive the kind of affection and love from me that you have always desired. It will be better. As one person put it, I wish I knew who said this. I do not, but it's not me. Someone said, the spirit inside you is better than the Jesus beside you. That's what's being said. 
Mary, stop holding on to me because I want to hold on to you in a far, far better way. Not just today or Monday or Tuesday evening, but forever. And so by the end of the story, you can tell that Jesus' reaction doesn't put Mary off at all. In fact, it says in verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Mary's mood has gone from despair to joy. And so, in conclusion, let me just simply ask you today, why are you crying? Now, this isn't to suggest that we still don't have tears. People die. There's chronic illness. There's loneliness. There is, there's cruelty that has been done to me and cruelty of my own. We cry, but the resurrection of Jesus tells us our tears are temporary. One day there will be no more death or pain or loneliness. Like Mary, we won't have any reason to cry. We will see the risen Lord face to face. The resurrection does remove our tears and replaces them with joy. God has taken hold of us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death, which is with satisfaction of your wrath. We thank you for his life, which gives us new life and new horizons to consider. We thank you for the Spirit, which now ministers the presence of the risen Lord to our hearts in ways that we could never have anticipated. We're so grateful, and we pray that today on this Easter morning, we would grow thankful and joyful for what you have done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.